Hello, Global Gardeners. A little bit of a shock there. I lost my internet a couple minutes ago, but luckily it came right back. So, nice to see you here today. Let's hope the internet stays up. It's been cold. It's been terrible weather for a lot of the United States. And I know some of you, like Jay, are dealing with issues where you don't even have power and are having to wait for that to come back. So let's stick with it for the next 90 minutes and talk gardening, which even in the midst of the cold can bring warmth to our hearts. Nice to see everybody here. Mr. Tidy Garden in Ireland is with us today. We've got a lot of the regulars. Hello to Robin's Container Garden, another nice UK channel that I enjoy watching the videos of. And as we talk about the weather, I'll give a shout out to Mr. Tidy Garden, who, has, who had a recent video talking about how to deal with the poor weather as a gardener. So all of us, be it rain or cold or even heat, because Patrick had a nice posting I'll talk about here at the end in Australia where it's too hot. We're all confronting these kind of issues, but we persevere and we enjoy our gardening. And today I want to talk about some of what I'm going to be doing in the new year. And I'd like to get your thoughts of what you're going to be doing in the new year. So shout out to Patty Barr and Hot Pepper Paul. Nice to see you here today. Adam Burley, a lot of the members of the Gardner Scott community. Two gals, Vermont Homestead with Gail. Frank Anselmo, haven't seen you here in a bit. So nice to have you back as well. Frank's just down the road from me here in Colorado. So so nice to see you here. Pat Patrick as well. Nice to see you here. Thank you for that contribution and super chat, Pat. Your thoughts about adjusting first and last frost dates in 2023. What are the best scientific sources for temperature trends? So that's a really good question. And I'm actually uh, working on a video. I did some footage when I hit minus 17 Fahrenheit a few days ago. So let's see that's about minus 27 celsius and i'm asking myself this same question how am i going to adjust my hardiness zone my first frost state my last frost state and the best source for pretty much all of us because most of the countries in the world have some organization in their government that monitors the temperatures. And so here in the United States, it's the USDA. They're the ones that put out the hardiness zone map. They're the ones that are tracking the meteorological data to give us the basic guidance for how we're going to garden as far as a hardiness zone is concerned. The National Weather Service here in the United States tracks that meteorological data. So you can actually go to the NWS website for your area and find out what the first frost date and last frost date should be historically on average. And so as far as a good source, check with your particular government's weather tracking service and that'll give you historical data. And so just, and this holds true for for pretty much all the countries that are on today that you're representing. Just do a, an internet search with meteorological data or historical weather and then put in where you live and you should get a link to that meteorological data. The problem is, and I think this is to your point, Pat, is it's historical. And so as far as the hardiness zones are concerned, they take into account about 30 years of historical data, determine the average, and then they kick it back to us for the recommendations for gardeners, for what hardiness zone we're in, what our frost dates are. And this is one reason why I've been encouraging, at least in the last month, that you journal what's happening in your garden and you get a weather station or an accurate form of measuring temperature and wind and other factors that influence the garden and start keeping track of it yourself. As I've said in videos and also in live streams in the past, I add a two week buffer 
to my last frost date in spring. And I also add a similar two week buffer to my first frost date in fall because I recognize by keeping track of it and by monitoring the trends in my garden that those dates are just a guideline. And in actuality, I end up seeing frost or cold temperatures after the suggested last frost date in spring. And I am typically seeing frosts before the suggested first frost date in autumn. So to account for that, I just give myself a buffer. And while my official growing season, when you look at those two dates that, that I are available if I search for them online, I have a 134 day growing season. But in actuality, I lop off about 20 to 24 days in my growing season. So when I'm growing my plants and starting my seeds, I figure that my growing season is about 100 to 110 days because I take into account that buffer period when the weather could be extreme and be outside the normal parameters. So that's how I adjust my first and last frost date. And I've been doing that for years and I will continue to do that as we move into 2023. And so as you look at your next year, 2023, start thinking about these kind of things. Do you need a buffer? Is your weather so variable that you need to build in that safety factor for you and your plants? If you live in a region with a really nice gradual increase in temperatures in spring, then you might not need to have a two week buffer. But do start thinking about that concept. The date, your last frost date in spring is just a guideline. It, it isn't a hard and fast date that you should plan everything around. It's just something to get you started with your garden planning. And then you kind of have to figure out what you're going to do in your specific area. And that's how I do it. It's just a two week buffer. Von Dykstra, nice to see you here as well. Merry Christmas to you and Happy New Year. Looking forward to more Gardener Scott videos next year. Thank you, so am I. And, and so that's, as I look to, to this new year, and that's why I wanted to, to have this, this show, this last show of 2022, start talking about next year. I'm not a big fan of New Year's resolutions. New Year's resolutions are some behavior that you want to change. And I just like to live every day as the best I can. But I do look at the new year as the opportunity to, to formulate and really create a concrete idea for my gardening plans moving into the new year. And so that definitely includes video. So in the last week, it probably doesn't surprise you, in the last week, I've already laid out the videos I'm planning to make in January and February and March. And of course, they all tie into various gardening activities that match what I'm doing. I've also already completed some videos this year that I'm not going to release till next year. I've mentioned in, in recent weeks that I'm going to be growing a lot of peppers in this next year. You might classify that as a New Year's resolution. I look at it as just garden planning. I'm gonna be growing a lot of peppers in the next year. Big reason why, I had incredible success this last year. And the fermented hot pepper sauce that I made was the best ever. So I'm hooked. I wanna make more and more and more of this hot pepper sauce in varying heats and varying flavors and I'm gonna do it. That's part of my garden plan. So the video I made a month or two ago with the fermented hot chili sauce is in the can, it's done. I'm not gonna release it until we get closer to pepper growing season. But these are the kind of things that, that I like to use the new year for, is to lay out my plan. What am I going to do? When am I going to do it? especially when it's something different from what you've been doing, 
it often helps to write it down and to put it on the calendar and to plan it accordingly. So you can look for a lot more videos of new things that I'll be doing. Another new arena that I'm moving into this year, and you'll see more videos on this, is hydroponics. I've kind of dabbled with hydroponics a little bit in the past. I'm going into it hot and heavy. So I've already got my hydroponic system. You'll see the process of me unboxing it and setting it up and growing plants indoors. And this ties in with a couple months ago, I want to do more indoor growing. And I've talked about that in, in the recent past. So I got a grow tent to experiment with that. I got a hydroponic system to experiment with that. And this is all new for me. I've been gardening for three decades, but this is really the first time that I've moved into grow tents and hydroponics. And so use this opportunity of the new year to maybe highlight some of those things that you haven't done before that you want to learn more about, experiment with, and maybe expand your gardening environment. Because I think that's really an important way to look at it. Dwayne's asking, what are the best types of peppers for container growing? So peppers are really ideal for container growing. So you can, you can grow pretty much any pepper in a container, as long as the container is big enough for the, the root system. And so in general, a container that is at least 12 inches in diameter and probably at least the same 12 inches deep should be adequate for, for most peppers. I find in my region, again, talking about how short it is, if I want to grow the, the hot peppers, containers are actually a better way to do it because a lot of those really hot peppers have a very long season. It takes a long time for them to germinate. It takes a long time for them to grow to size. And then it takes a long time for them to flower and fruit and for that fruit to become fully ripe, which is what you usually want with those super hot peppers. So for those of us that are in a shorter growing uh, time frame, then the hot peppers are really a good idea to put in containers because in the autumn, as those temperatures start to fall a little bit and in late summer, I can move those peppers indoors under lights. I can move them to my greenhouse. I can move them closer to the house so the heat of the house helps keep them warm at night. And so that's the way I like to go with the, the container gardening and with peppers is the if, if you are a little bit challenged with your weather, maybe try some of those kind of peppers in a container that you can move into the sun or into a sheltered area or give it that protection when cold weather threatens and you may have better success with it. So any pepper can be grown, but I, I tend to focus on those peppers that may not survive in my normal garden beds. And instead I can put them into the containers and expect to have some success. Steve from the garden, nice to see you here. I grew hydroponic lettuce two years ago. You go from seed to harvest in 30 days. Absolutely. In fact, that's actually my first planned crop. I'm going to be experimenting with some different media from the clay to perlite to cocoa core. And I'll probably be growing either the same or similar lettuce in my hydroponic system in the different media to be able to compare the results of it. So uh, as hydroponics go, uh, lettuce is about the easiest thing to do, and that's a great way to break in. So I'll be following your lead, and I'm definitely going to be doing the hydroponic lettuce. I don't want to start too difficult since it is kind of a, a new thing that I'm going to be trying on, and then we'll be going from there. Merry Christmas to you, Tony, at Simplified Gardening. Happy Boxing Day to the, the rest of you who are celebrating the day after Christmas and I, I hope it was a good holiday for everybody. Riverdale Gardens, also nice to see you here on a day that you have available. I've noticed peppers do great in containers, so when I run out of room in the garden, the peppers get kicked in. There you go. So peppers in containers are uh, a nice way to do it, and I completely agree that that's a good way to start. Christy Grows, nice to have you here. Welcome back. I'm experimenting with starting peppers at the moment in a makeshift grow room using what I have on hand. Awesome. Now, the nice thing about peppers, and, and I actually 
I think this video is coming out in a couple of weeks. I'll be talking about using a heat mat in seed germination. And peppers, particularly the hot pepper seeds, do better if you can germinate them in a warmer environment. And so my grow room in my basement is the coldest room of the house. And my seeds germinate, the seedlings grow, everything's fine. But when I use a, a heat mat, particularly underneath the peppers, the germination is faster and those seedlings get off to a much better start. Now, I like using the heat mat, but before I had a heat mat, I was using incandescent bulbs and the heat of the bulb is often enough to warm up that area around the, the germinating seed. So think about that. If you don't have a warm grow room and you don't have a heat mat and you don't have incandescent bulbs, you can germinate your pepper seeds on top of your refrigerator. If you've ever put your hand on top of the refrigerator, it's pretty warm up there. So that's actually a very good spot to germinate seeds because the seed in most cases doesn't require light. It just requires the warmth and the medium and the water. And as long as you're providing that for those seeds and you put it into a nice warm spot, like on top of your refrigerator, then you can get your germination to happen a little bit faster than in the cool air of winter that many of us are encountering right now. So good luck to you, Christy Grows, and look forward to seeing feedback in the days ahead as all of us are, are growing our peppers and seeing what kind of results we have. Hopefully it's all going to be successful. Okay, scrolling down, Andrea, my newest experiment come spring 2023. I'll be growing tiny temp tomatoes. I've seen them all over, but have never grown them. There you go. That's exactly what I'm looking for today. Those ideas of what's new for 2023 that you're going to be doing. And, and I, honestly, I haven't grown tiny temp tomatoes either. So uh, that gives me some ideas of something I might want to try as we move forward as well. And looks like we've got in the garden with Eli and Kate. Good representation from the UK today. So nice to see you here as well. And Christy Grows did Romano peppers this year. Two plants in a 30 liter bucket in the greenhouse. And we're superb trying to overwinter them this year. So we'll see what spring brings. Good for you. Yeah, overwintering, that's one nice thing that many of you in the UK have the advantage on me when it comes to overwintering. I I have a very, very cold greenhouse right now, and anything that I would have attempted to overwinter would have been frozen solid, so it doesn't always work as well. It depends on where we're growing. Robin's Container Garden, planning to grow raspberries and blueberries in containers next season. I've not grown them before, so this will be fun. Good for you. Last year, that was on my list, and so that I would started growing blueberries uh, this last year in containers. I did a video about preparing the soil. The biggest issue I've had, and I did not expect it, or I didn't anticipate it, kind of sort of thought it might happen, but didn't really think it would. I had the blueberries in containers. I spent a few months in advance getting the, the soil acidic, preparing for them. Picked a couple different varieties because it helps to have at least two different varieties of blueberries to get the most fruit. Put them in the containers. They were starting to grow great. And they're closer to my house than the rest of the garden. I didn't think the deer would find my blueberry plants, but they did. So the blueberries are now in the pots overwintering outside as, as part of an experiment to see if they could handle my harsh winter in a container. They should, but not everything does well in a container in my winters. But they were eaten by the deer. So I had to cover them with netting, and hopefully they weren't eaten so much that it, it caused so much damage that they won't recover. So uh, I'd throw that out to all of you who are looking to try new things. You have to anticipate those pests in your garden that might not be a pest, until you try something new and you are focusing on that new plant 
And then when the deer come, or the squirrels dig it up, or the raccoons eat all of the fruit, whatever that issue happens to be, if you've got one of those kind of animal pests in your garden now, even if it's in a completely opposite area of your garden, if you try something new, you can expect they're probably going to find that new plant or that new bed or that new experiment that you're trying. So I, I wish I would have anticipated a little bit more that the deer would venture close enough to my house to actually pose a problem with my blueberries. But live and learn. It's all part of the whole gardening experience, isn't it? So, okay, let's see what else we have. Ginger Snap's been researching natural medicine herbs and flowers for family health needs, collecting seeds and roots to make medicine and tea garden. That's awesome. I really like that idea. I, I have a number of different garden ideas that are on my plan or just in my mind. One of them is an, is an herb garden, um, that a, a nice formal garden that I'll be building at some point in the next couple years. And as part of my herb garden, I'm anticipating and planning to put in the medicinal plant. So I love that idea. And, and it's one of those things that, that it does take some research and you gotta find the right plant for your area, but it can make a big difference in your family's health, absolutely. So uh, I'm glad to hear that, that's wonderful. Okay, let's see. Break a leg is saying, going to strap a carrot on my drone to see what will happen. Will this count as a garden experiment? Absolutely. <laughs> Anything new, I need to get my drone out and, and flying around. I hadn't thought about strapping carrots to it, but absolutely. If, if, it's, if it's related to gardening in any way, it's a gardening experiment. So I say go for it. <clears throat> Lisa Par Potter's trying shallots from seed. That's challenging. I've, I've tried that a few times and have had mixed results to plant in the spring instead of fall planted bulbs. The fall ones always bolt for me, so I'm trying them this way. Also trying leeks for the first time. Good. I've had some pretty good success with leek. Leeks and shallots uh, in general can be a challenge just because of how long they take to germinate and then to grow and then to reach that point of harvest. So uh, good for you, Lisa. That, 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 in my experience, has been a challenging experience so I, I wish you the best as you move forward with that and uh, it's definitely educational as you try those things that might be challenging in your particular garden or your particular area so and john jude trying several types of zucchini hopefully i have less problems with beetles and one will thrive and so this raises a, a, a good issue and one reason that i keep suggesting over and over again to experiment with new things in your garden. And so zucchini is a good example, and thank you for that, John, that we may think of a particular plant, a zucchini, a squash, a melon, even a tomato, where it's one variety that we grow. And for many gardeners, they try growing one variety and then the pests eat it up or they just can't grow. It just has some type of difficulty in their growing space. And particularly new gardeners keep growing that same plant because that's the only variety they know, or it might be the only seed pack they have. Whereas, I like John's idea, try growing a number of different varieties of the same plant, like zucchini. Grow two or three or four or five different types of zucchini. And then, this is where the observation and the analysis comes in. Which one did better? Did the insect pests eat all of one particular type and leave another type alone? Well, then maybe focus on that other type. Was one growing bigger than the others? Well, make note of that. And then as you move forward in the years ahead, when you choose a single variety to grow in your garden, the reason you're choosing that variety is because you've experimented and you've discovered that that's the one that does best in your garden. As opposed to that's the one you bought off the seed rack, it's the one that you've already determined does best. So that's the one you're going to grow. So for me, 
the 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 black beauty is a variety that I like growing. And for cucumbers, it's the market more. And for the tomatoes, it's the black crim. I have very specific varieties that I know will do well for me in my garden. Beyond that, I continue to experiment because you never know when you're going to find something that does better than the one that you already know is going to do well. And so I, I like that idea of using the year to to grow a, diff a lot of different varieties to find out which one is going to overcome the soil problems, the weather problems, the pest problems, whatever it happens to be, keep, keep going with it. And things should be uh, better in the long run. Robin's saying, I did that this year with tomatoes. Kept very good notes and have made the choices for next year. Good for you, Robin. That's, that's exactly the way to do it because it's one of those things that um, I, th I think as I age and as gardening becomes more challenging physically, I'm trying to make it as easy as possible in my years ahead. I'm using the time now and I've been using recent years to try to find those best varieties and those best methods and how to garden most effectively. And I've shared a lot of that in videos. There's a lot more to come. All with the intent that when I'm really old, I can still garden and it's gonna be easy, super easy, because the varieties I'm growing are the ones I know are gonna be easy to grow in my specific garden. And so kind of think about that in the back of your brain. Even if you're still really young age-wise, Make it easy, make it as easy as possible so that you can start venturing into this, the new arena, new arenas with the varieties that you're going to choose and the expansion of your garden and all those other things that tend to overtake us in time. It's, it, it really can be a lot of fun. Nan is a, a nerd says, I've only found varieties that I don't like. Haven't found a perfect tomato variety yet. That's actually very helpful as well. Uh, Crossing things off the list is as important as finding the things that you want to grow. So, uh, Nana's a nerd, keep trying, keep growing more things. You've got your list of things that aren't working and that you aren't going to be growing. And when you do find the one that you like, ah, it, it's going to, to stand out like a sore thumb. It's going to be such a clear choice that you'll know you definitely want to, to move forward with that. In the garden with Eli and Kate. Define really old. When do we get to take it easy? So um, that, that's a good point. Uh, I don't know what really old is yet because I haven't reached that point. I like to think that age is more mental than it is physical. Now granted, some of those physical things can get in the way as your body doesn't always cooperate. But in my mind, I'm still way young. So I think really old is the point in your life when your physical age matches your mental age. If you allow yourself to think that you're really old, then you're really old. Instead, I suggest that you keep your mental age as young as possible. And as long as you are mentally young, you'll never be really old. So while I joke about becoming really old. I'm hoping that point is a long way away. And I expect that it is because I'm wanting to go outside and garden. And I still think of myself as much younger than I am, which is why I work as hard as I do outside, maybe a little bit sore when I come in at night. But oh, it feels so good to, to get sore because you're staying active and you're keeping your brain young. So I, I like that question, but uh, it's, it, it's a definition that we each have to define for ourselves. And taking it easy is gonna be that point that, I don't know if I'm ever gonna hit that point. My wife's grandfather, I've mentioned this a couple times in the past, my wife's grandfather actually died in his garden. Now this was a number of years ago, but he loved gardening and he gardened well into his 80s, if I remember. I never met him, but uh, he, he died in his garden. That's kind of how I want to go. 
If you've got to go, why not do something you love as the last thing that happens to you in your life? And I don't want to be maudlin about this, but this is one of those things that mental age plays into it, physical age plays into it, but gardening is one of those things that keeps me young and will keep me from getting very old. So I wasn't planning on talking about this today, but hopefully that does help. So Jay is with us. Nice to see you here. Jay and Heidi are always so fantastic helping out with the channel every week. Starting 10 years ago, all medium and large projects are towards goal of easier gardening as I age. Absolutely. There you go. And, you know, and as as younger, newer gardeners get into gardening and realize it is a journey they want to take for the rest of their lives, they're not necessarily thinking about what they'll do in old age. But as some of us are approaching old age or already in it, it does become a much more important factor. So, yeah, I agree with Jay a lot. Uh, and I'd say for me, it started about 10 years ago, maybe a little bit less. But uh, that's that's why I bring it up, because it is one of those things that play with how we treat ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis. And the garden awful often fits into that. And so Tony agrees that that's how he wants to go, too. So what an awesome idea that uh not that any of us are looking forward to dying but when the time comes that's the way to do it and so eli's saying what you're implying robin's container garden i'm only 39 so you know mentally i th i think of myself i'm about 34 years old mentally and it's changed you know i remember in my in like 10 years ago, I was 29 and 10 years before that, I was about 24. So my mental age is aging, but my mental age is aging at a much slower rate than my physical age. And so uh, whatever that age is for you, be it 39 or for me, seriously, I, I consciously think about this from time to time that my mindset of what I want to do and the way I look at my activities match pretty much with what I was doing when I was actually 34 years old. So that's why I say my mental age is 34, because I can remember being 34 and what I wanted to do and what I could do and what I was actively doing. And that matches with what I think now, even though it may lead to a sore body at the end of the day. My, my daughter uh, sent a note last night so she got her family Twister, the, the Twister game uh, for Christmas. And so she and, and her daughters, I'm not sure if her husband was involved. It was probably just the three girls. But they played Twister alongside the Christmas tree last night. And she texted that after two games of Twister, She's doubting if she's even going to be able to make it out of bed this morning. So our bodies definitely age and may not match with what our mental age tells us we should be doing. But she's not particularly old, but she's old enough to know that her body doesn't handle a good game of Twister like it used to. So I thought that was a bit humorous for those of us that might be tempted to play Twister in the new year something you might want to think twice about. Berghaus, my Christmas holidays were totally about indoor seeding lettuces, onions, chard, herbs to fill my illuminated shelves. I simply cannot do without gardening. HR trays are top. Good for you. <coughs> I I uh, have already started that same process as well. I'm sure many of you are doing it and I'm glad to hear that, that it's a, a nice way to fill the holidays because doing without gardening can be difficult and even if it's just starting a, a new project and so i'm starting a new project here in the next couple of weeks my son got me a a do it at home bonsai kit and i do have a, a small bonsai tree that i i keep to size and it's doing pretty well i've had it for a number of years and this kit is to grow a tree and then learn about bonsai and shape it. With the kit are pine tree seeds. 
and living in an area with a lot of pine trees and spruce trees and fir trees I know it takes a long 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 time for these trees to grow from seed to any size so as we talk about age and mental age as well I'm looking at this bonsai kit that my son got me and realizing that it's probably going to be 10 years from this seed if I can get it to germinate to grow to the size where I can even begin to think about doing a bonsai shape to it so that's one of the nice things about gardening is we can look 10 years into the future and think of it as like no big deal yeah it's a kit it's something I'll be doing and I'm gonna start in a couple of couple weeks and 10 years from now I'll let you know how it goes because that's just kind of the way some of the the gardening activities work in how we we approach our gardening so a lot of fun Yankee Sista Homestead nice to see you I've been wanting a gorilla card for two years can't wait to put some mileage on it that's some nice chuckles that's good uh, I had a I, we talked about this a few months ago I think when we were talking about gifts and things that we wanted in gorilla card uh, is is way high on on the list for what I think gardeners can look forward to having a good tool in their garden the gorilla cards are nice I've owned one in the past at the Galileo school and it really is a, a wonderful thing to own JS I think I tricked the wild rabbits the burlap fence seems to work it seems that if they don't see my blueberry bushes they ignore them good for you burlap fence is actually a great idea and I haven't seen any of our regular Australian people pop up yet but you can look into the history of the fencing in Australia to deal with the wild rabbits and so the idea of the burlap fence is definitely a good one and that's that's I don't it, it's the same but different I've talked about this before with the rabbits I have in my garden and that's one reason why I have the tall raised beds because the rabbits are running around the base of the bed they can't see what's in the bed and often that is an, a, an extremely effective way to deal with animal pets is just to keep them from seeing what's on the other side and for deer for instance my last house we had a big deer problem I put up a six foot high fence the deer could jump over that fence but it was a solid fence so they couldn't see what was on the other side they never jumped over the fence and so blocking your garden or whatever it is you're trying to protect from those pests very effective and for rabbits yeah and, and the burlap fence doesn't even need to be that high just needs to be high enough so that what's ever on the other side is out of sight for the rabbits so uh, that's that's an awesome way to trick them I bet it's also a very smart way to approach tricking them so good for you I think that's a nice thing to to discover Francis what do folk think of a small chipper shredder not the thousand dollar beast just a small electric we talked about this a couple weeks ago when we were um, talking about um, mulch and gifts and things like that and I'm I'm trying to remember back to some of the the comments that we had when we were talking about chipper shredders it's a great idea the 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 first big tool actually it was the second the first big tool I bought for my garden a couple decades ago was a tiller and the second was a chipper shredder now I no longer use the tiller because I've modified how I garden I'm not actively tilling my garden like I thought you needed to do 20 years ago but I still have my tiller I just haven't run in a while I still have my chipper shredder I don't use it as often as I should because it's got a broken blade on it but it's a great tool you don't need to spend a thousand dollars I would suggest that you you don't get the really cheap ones the the little plug-in ones that aren't, aren't much bigger than your arm they're relatively worthless you want one that is big enough and strong enough to chip your branches so whatever it is you're going to be feeding into it so if you're going to be feeding in tree branches from that you're pruning 
anticipate the size of those branches and then get a chipper shredder that can handle the size of those branches without too much difficulty. If all you're going to be doing is chipping up leaves and dried grass, then that might affect a different decision in choosing the size and the power of your chipper shredder. I went with a gas powered chipper shredder just because at the time my garden was well away from the house. And so I could move the chipper shredder, start it up and chip all of the, the branches that were going to become mulch in my garden. If you're gardening closer to the house, get an electric one with a long extension cord. So uh, that's, those, that's my input, Francis, on the idea of a chipper shredder. And anyone else, I have, I'll scroll down, see if there's any other comments in the short term here. But yeah, I think that's a, that's a really nice tool that uh, you can add to your toolbox to create your own mulches or uh, chop up your material to throw into your compost. Lots of reasons to have a, a chipper shredder. And so Yankee Sista Homestead says, I love mine, just chipping leaves and small branches. There you go. That's the kind of thing that can really make a big difference. Phoenix Sullivan had a four-year-old grapevine last year that I was so excited about producing his first real harvest. Then a wet spring hit, black rot set in. What can I do preventatively this year? And so uh, that's a good question. And this, uh, this holds true for grapevines. It holds true for berry bushes. It holds true for, for asparagus and rhubarb, all of those perennial food crops that we want to grow on a regular basis. And so mulching can be an important factor. Pruning and spacing is also important. And so as you look at these plants that, that you're growing on a regular basis, like grapevines, for instance, sometimes there's not a lot you can do about it. You, you'll read about the vineyards in various parts of the world that have issues with weather. France periodically goes through this and they lose a lot of the crop and then the wine production is impacted. And it's not just France, it's all over the world. So some of those issues you really can't avoid. The weather is just going to overpower your garden. But in our garden, the thing that gives us an advantage that a lot of these vineyards don't have is the size. If you've got 100 acres of grape vines, you can't get out there and do the pruning and do the protection and do the control when the weather impacts you. But if you only got one or two grape vines, you can. And so for, for something like uh, the black rot, and anticipate, hopefully, you're not gonna get those type of uh, rains in the spring, but you can, at least in the short term, cover your plants. And, and I've done this in the past as well when we had some exceptionally wet springs, very unusual for me. But you take a, a tarp, for instance, and you throw the tarp over the grapevine and allow the rain to shed off so that that area doesn't get as wet as the rest of your garden. That's one possible way to do it. Pruning out branches to allow airflow in and help dry out the, the ground is another great option. Depending on what kind of mulch you're using, you may want to use mulch to help shed off some of the water, or you may actually want to rake away the mulch so that it doesn't hold in the water. And when the sun comes out, it helps dry out the soil. And so I've seen this with a lot of rotting issues. I love mulch. I advocate mulch. You should be using mulch in most areas of your garden, but sometimes the mulch can keep the wet soil wet. And so by raking off the mulch and allowing the sun when it comes out to dry the soil might be one of those things that you could do to, to help avoid some rot issues. Just trying to keep the water away and then also trying to help ensure that that area dries out faster. It's, it's really about, about all you can do when you're, you're confronting weather issues like that. And in a, in a garden, you might be able to deal with that with just a couple plants and be able to overcome some of those problems. So 
uh, those those are some inputs, some ideas that I've used and I'm aware of, and hopefully that might help you out there, Phoenix Sullivan, as you move into the future. Shandy's Garden, couldn't you get a smaller chipper and smaller splitter? Wouldn't that make it to where you can pretty much split and chip everything? I'll have trees on my next property. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the idea is when you get a, a, a chipper shredder, is it needs to match whatever you're gonna be chipping and shredding. And so if you've got bigger branches or you've got bigger pieces of, of whatever it is you're putting into it, by cutting the size that goes into it, it allows you to use a smaller unit, smaller horsepower. Uh, so by all means, if you've got a splitter and you can split those branches or you can split those logs into the smaller size first, absolutely, you can get by with a, a smaller chipper shredder. It, it just means you, you need to have a couple size tools or a couple tools to be able to handle the, the size that you've got. So uh, Gardens Happen has found dry banana leaves makes great mulch. Uh, yeah, if you've got access to banana leaves, absolutely go for it. I don't think I've seen a banana leaf in the state of Colorado in all the time I live here, but uh, absolutely. Whatever it is you have available in your area, I highly recommend that is where you should start in developing your own mulches. And some of the leaves like um, banana leaves and palm leaves are thicker and actually will stand up as a sturdy mulch a little bit better than those of us that might have uh, oak leaves or willow leaves or leaves that aren't quite as sturdy. So yeah, that's definitely an approach to take. Use, use what you have and you can save money and also be pretty effective. Serena Norrell, I have to go. So when you get to my question, can you type a response? I rely on captions since I'm almost deaf. So I haven't seen your question. Let me scroll up and see if I can come across it while I'm screening. I know I've missed a lot. Um, go ahead and type your question again. Oh, there you go. Um, do you grow basil, thyme, and borage with your squash plants to keep away unplant unwanted pests? So sort of. So I do have uh, basil and thyme, and I also have sage and, and mint and tarragon very close to my primary squash bed. Now, it's more of a coincidence because I have my herb bed very close to my garden beds in general. And so in general, I spread my herb plants, I spread my flower plants, I spread my grass plants. I even allow a lot of the native weeds to grow throughout my garden space. And by having those plants grow throughout the garden space, they're encouraging the beneficial insects to come in. So now one of the reasons basil and thyme in particular is grown by a lot of gardeners is because they think the aroma keeps pests from coming to the garden. And there's mixed research on that. Borage is a great plant to grow if you allow it to flower to attract the beneficial insects. And so I grow borage in a different area separately from my herb garden because I'm growing borage for the purpose of attracting those beneficial insects, not to actually eat, uh, and because it is a, a plant that you can eat and can really be delicious. And so to your, to your question, I'm, I'm doing this throughout my garden, not just for my squash plants. And it's not to keep away the unwanted pests because one, one thyme plant on the end of the bed, and actually I've got thyme in a different section in my concrete block bed. I've got thyme growing in those holes in the concrete blocks because it's another area of my garden and I intersperse these plants throughout. They have minimal impact on keeping the pests out. They have a great impact on attracting the beneficial pests that will keep the unwanted pests out. So if you can attract the beneficial predatory wasps and the lacewings and the ladybugs and the praying mantids, all those 
predatory insects, that's really, I think, a better focus. And a lot of these plants that are assumed to keep pests away are really attracting the predators and the predators are keeping the pests away. And so for a gardener to look and say, oh, I grew borage and I don't have pests in that bed anymore. Well, it's really not the borage that's dispelling the pests. It's the borage attracting the predators. And so that's uh, that's how I approach it. And so, yes, I do grow those plants, but not just around my squash plants. I grow them throughout the garden. And that's the, the, the best results that I've seen. I had, this was only my third year gardening in this garden of mine. I effectively had no pests. I, I really didn't have anything. Last year, I had flea beetles and pirate bugs and I had a harlo one harlequin beetle that showed up and kept on top of it the year before. And this year, I really didn't have a pest problem. But that's because I started planting more and more of the herbs and the flowers and the grasses. And I did a video a year or two ago where I talked about allowing the weeds to grow because the weeds will attract your native insect predators and that, that's been very successful for me so variety throughout the gort the garden can really make a huge issue and impact when it comes to those kind of, of uh, insects that you have and so serena is asking specifically about predators that eat squash bugs so squash bugs are one of those insects that that they don't have a lot of they don't have the big insect predators that are going to come in and so uh, squash bugs and cucumber beetles and a lot of those insects it's more important to understand the life cycle of those insects and then work to disrupt that life cycle and so that me may, may mean putting a cover over your plants so that the adults can't come in and lay eggs at the time of year that they're laying eggs in your garden it may mean disrupting the soil so that those eggs that are laid in the soil and then grow into larva and then the larva is overwintering in the soil and you come out in spring and just rough up the top of your soil to expose all those grubs that can be a great option so a lot of it depends on uh, the specific pests you have and a squash bug is not going to be impacted by a predatory wasp Instead, you're gonna to have to get out there and pluck off the squash bugs that you see and then learn a little bit more about the life cycle so that you can disrupt their life cycle so they're not laying eggs to become a problem in the future. And, and that's a big reason why I think I didn't have problems this year because again, last year I saw a harlequin bug beetle and plucked it off and never saw another one. And I dealt with the pests I had, those bigger pests, that aren't uh, so much disturbed by the little predators. And if you stay on top of it, you can really get control over the pests in your garden. Okay, let's see, sunset gazing. Holy basil re red, really attracts the bumblebees too. It was my morning entertainment with coffee, watching birds, butterflies, and bumblebees. Absolutely, yeah. I, I love getting out in the garden as well, watching, I've got so much footage videos that I've shot of the bumblebees on the flowers. I just love it. And so uh, I, I agree with you, growing plants that will attract the bees in addition to the, the other beneficial insects. I love watching it all as well. And I love seeing the butterflies that start coming into the garden. And I look forward to when that's going to happen because I'm still a few months away, but looking forward to it. John saying, I have almost zero pest problems and no bug killers. Five seasons to do see lots of spiders in my grass clippings and leaves. Good for you. Yeah, when you start seeing the spiders, and, and occasionally I get asked, uh, what do I do to get rid of spiders in my garden? And I say nothing. When you see the spiders in your garden, it shows that you're doing something right. It's showing that you're creating that balance because the spiders are going to take care of a lot of the, take care of a lot of those 
pests that you have. So good for you, John. Yeah, when you start seeing the spiders and then when you start seeing the snakes and the toads and the frogs and the salamanders and the lizards, yeah, I, I, I think that's a healthy garden environment. And when you start seeing all of those, along with the flowers and the grasses and the herbs that you're growing, your pest problem will be close to zero, like, like John says. That's really a good way to, to start approaching it. Luscious journey. Should I start sowing my seeds now inside? It depends. It depends on the seed you're growing. It depends on when your last frost date is in spring. And so the seed packets, most of the seed packets that we buy will give a guideline if it should be started inside. And if so, when to start it inside. And so the, the guideline that these seed packets will use is your last frost date. And so for instance, on tomato seeds, it might say start indoors six to eight weeks before your last frost date. That's when you should be starting. So for Lashes Journey, you need to find out if you don't already know your last frost date in spring. And it's simple, simple search. Just type in last frost date and your city and it'll kick back at you what your last frost date is. Then back that up based on what it is you're growing. And so I did a video, no doubt Jay's going to pop it up with a link here pretty soon. I did a video this last year where I covered that, when to start your seeds indoors. And it varies by the type of seeds. So tomato seeds might be six to eight weeks before your last frost date. Pepper seeds might be 10 to 12 weeks before your last frost date. So be careful about starting all of your seeds at the same time indoors because the, the seeds will germinate at different rates. The plants will grow at different rates and you need to try to match it all with when you're actually going to be putting the plants out into your garden. For me, like I said at the beginning, I add on two week buffer. So my last frost date is about May 18th, but I don't plan to put anything in my garden, any of those plants until around June 1st. I still use the last frost date as a guideline for starting my tomatoes. So I'll start my tomatoes six to eight weeks before my May 18th last frost date. By the time they go outside, they're two weeks older than that. So the tomato plants that I'm actually putting into my garden are eight to 10 weeks from when I sowed those seeds. That's what I've learned here in Colorado over time for when I should start my seeds. Other seeds, I'll be starting some herb seeds here uh, probably next week, maybe the week after, because a lot of those plants take longer to grow. And so the the thyme and the rosemary and the sage, you can start those plants four or five months before you put them outside and you have a nice healthy plant when you, you transplant it into your garden. So it all depends on the plant and it all depends on your last frost date in determining when you start sowing your seeds. And particularly for newer gardeners, I know it can be a big problem because you'll watch a video and it'll be in January and someone will say, sow your seeds now, get those plants started. Well, they might be living in San Diego or in Georgia or South Carolina. And for them, starting seeds in January or February makes complete sense because they're going to be putting those plants out in their garden in March. Well, that doesn't hold true for everybody because here in Colorado, like I said, I can't put plants out into June because my season is just too short and my winter is just too long. So you have to match it with your garden and do be careful about just following the blanket advice from YouTubers who don't anticipate that someone's going to be watching their video that lives in a completely different area. You got to match up with what's going to work best for your garden. And so typically about April or May, I start getting questions from gardeners saying, I started my tomatoes back in January, but it's still too cold and they're taking over and they're too big. What do I do? And the answer is next year, don't start them as early. 
and you won't have to worry about it because sometimes the plants can get too big and when it comes time to transplant they just won't do as well because they've been too big and too small a pot so avoid that issue by just figuring out when to start correctly and you'll have uh, much better success with that and here's a link that Jay has posted this isn't my video but it's a nice link to give you a general idea for for zone six and so depending on where you live you can find similar charts but it does come down to uh, what you're you're growing in where Rafael is asking do you plan to winter so soon so I've already sowed uh my uh flower seeds winter sowed flower seeds uh in different areas of my yard i'm not planning on doing other than onions and I, i've talked about this in recent weeks as well so i'm not planning on doing any winter sowing for the other plants in my garden this year because i'm going to be trying new things uh, the the time i would be spending on that i'm going to be spending on hydroponics and learning some of the other things that i want to be learning this year and so I've done winter sowing in recent years. I did a video on that, and that may be why you're asking. Uh, so I'll winter sow my flower seeds and some seeds like onions. But as far as the rest of the stuff, like I showed in that video, uh, I'm actually not going to be doing it this year. I, I think it's it's nice, just the way I approach it, to mix things up a little bit. So I'll do winter sowing for two or three years in a row, and then I won't do it for two or three years. And then I'll get back to it. And the same in my vegetable garden. I'll be growing a particular type of plant, like eggplant. I've grown eggplant for the last couple of years, enjoyed it, realized I don't eat as much eggplant as I grow, so I'm not planning on growing eggplant this year. That's okay. It's okay to break things up, try new things, don't do the old things. And for me, this year, the winter sowing is the, the same thing. So uh, specifically to your question, I'm actually not planning to do it. But for those of you who might be interested in winter sowing, now is actually probably a pretty good time. January and February for many of us tend to be a pretty good time of year to start doing winter sowing. And so you can check out that video. I know there's lots of other videos out there as well and lots of information that you can, you can find out about the winter sowing and when it's cold and things are dormant that's typically a good time to to start doing it james is wondering i got some seeds from apple tree an apple tree at my parents when they moved what would be the best season to start trying to grow light indoor grow how long would the seeds still germinate so apple seeds uh, typically will need some cold stratification and so if you haven't put them in the refrigerator yet you should put them in the refrigerator i think it's typically about a month those seeds should be in the refrigerator before you try to get them to germinate and then it can take a while for those seeds to germinate uh, like weeks potentially so put them in the refrigerator get them cold for about a month then they can take a couple weeks to germinate then they start growing once they start growing then yes you should have them under lights you won't need them under lights for the the cold stratification or for the germination phase uh, and then assuming that you started now conceivably in a couple months you could have some apple seeds that have germinated and started to grow realize if you didn't know this when you grow apple trees from seed you're not going to get the same apple as the tree was that you collected the seed from. Apples require pollination from two different apple trees, and those trees are two different varieties, and all apple seeds are hybrid seeds because of the process and how apple trees pollinate themselves, or each other, I should say. And so, Every apple tree that's grown from seed is a hybrid tree that doesn't match any other apple tree. If you're growing an apple tree from seed with the intent of grafting a branch from another apple tree with a known fruit, that'll work. So for instance, I'm in the process right now actually of, of uh, cold stratifying some gala apples and I'm gonna be growing those from seed, but the resulting apple tree is not going to taste anything like a gala apple. 
I have no idea what it's going to taste like. It's a gamble when you grow apple trees from seed. It can be a lot of fun. It takes years to get to the point that you finally harvest the fruit and eat it and see if it was worth the effort as far as harvesting the fruit. But be aware that it is a gamble as to what the fruit's actually going to look like and taste like just because of the way that the apple trees grow. Um, so go ahead and get started, James. Get those seeds cold, then start them germinating. You can probably expect you're not going to get a real high germination rate and just have some patience for how long it's going to take for those apple seeds to actually germinate and start growing. So, okay, I'm trying to catch up with where the comments are at this point. Tammy's saying, I'm hoping to get the pawpaw trees to grow. I source the seeds locally, so they should grow well here. Um, good for you. I actually um, grew some pawpaw trees at the Galileo Garden. I got them as bare root trees and they were doing pretty well. That was about the time that I retired, so I don't know how well they're doing right now, but I've never tried growing those from seed. A lot of the trees of the fruits that we eat can be difficult to grow from uh, a seed, but when you get them to grow, it, it really is pretty cool and it really is nice to, to see the result of that. So next, wondering, does winter sowing mean in the ground or inside in trays? And so winter sowing, um, as I think it was intended and in the video I made, is sowing outside. And so there's a couple approaches you could take where you take a seed and I actually wait till it snows and I just throw the seed on the snow. And then when the snow melts, it brings the, so the, the seed down into contact with the soil. I find that to be the easiest way. But most of the winter sowing that, that we've been talking about in recent years and the reason I made a video is where you take something like a milk jug, a gallon milk jug, you cut it in half, you put the bottom half, fill it with a potting soil, you sow your seeds in that soil, then you just cover the top again with the top half of the milk jug and put it outside in your winter conditions. And as your weather warms up, that soil warms up and you'll have the little seedlings that sprout up inside that gallon milk jug. And then you can transplant those little seedlings in other areas of the garden. So it's a way to let nature determine when those seeds are going to germinate. And then those plants will grow naturally as though they were just sown on the ground in the open. But because you've got it in a milk jug, it makes it nice and easy for you to be able to, to dig them out and transplant them as needed. So. Um, that's typically what we talk about with the winter sowing is in some type of container, usually with a cover on it, outside, and then allowing those seeds to germinate when nature determines that it's warm enough and that there's enough light. Uh, th the other sowing that we do indoors is just sowing in winter as it matches with your last frost date and with the, the plants that you happen to be growing. And so while I'm thinking about it, this is my garden this morning, and I just wanted to point out as, as we move into the new year, the activities I still have left to do. I've left all of these. These are Cosmos, and these there's some other um, Cosmos over here, and on this other side are my raspberries, um, and I've got the asparagus growing in this bed, but I've left all my my seed pods growing for the birds and they've been pretty much picked clean so i my garden looks like this in the new year in most years because i just let everything go for the insects and for the birds to feed on during the cold months of winter and as the day is warm up hopefully that's going to happen sometime soon then i'll get out and i'll start cleaning my garden beds and getting them all ready for next year's plantings but when i talk about winter sowing i uh, what I did with like these cosmos right here on this side is I took those seed heads and just spread those seeds everywhere. Everywhere in this area, in the back of the garden back here. And that's how I approached winter sowing, particularly with my perennial and annual flowers, is I just take the seeds and just spread them around. And where they germinate, it's, it's kind of the idea of putting it in a milk jug as far as the winter sowing is concerned. They're going to germinate when nature decides that it's warm enough and there's enough sun for them to germinate. 
I'll spread hundreds of seeds. And I might only get a few dozen plants because that's also the way nature works. The birds are going to eat them off the ground. Some of them are going to rot. Not all of them are going to be in the best position to germinate. And so I do a whole bunch of seeds and then hope for whatever happens best. And this whole area back here, I've talked about it in some of my videos this year. I didn't sow anything this year other than those seeds that I spread a year ago. And I had great success with that pollinator garden in particular this year. So that also ties in with the concept of winter sowing. It doesn't have to be orderly with specific seed types in a gallon jug. It can be just spread what you have that's already demonstrated its ability to grow in your garden and spread it to other areas of your garden with the idea being that it's more likely to germinate and grow since it already knows it likes your garden. And that's a good way to, to spread out the plants that you have growing. The Sabi gal is wondering about seed bombs for winter sowing too. Absolutely. And so I, I did a video on seed bombs uh, this last year. And that's one of the things I talk about is, and that's exactly what I did in that video a year ago is uh, I made seed bombs and I put the seed bombs in my garden for winter sowing. I just placed them in areas past the point of the warm weather and they were going to germinate in the cold. And yeah, actually, I, I, should, I didn't even think about doing a follow up video with that. Um, but uh, many of those seed bombs that I just placed in different areas of my garden in late autumn uh, or early spring or even in winter, depending on when you decide to do it, but yeah, yeah, they sprouted absolutely. And it really wasn't much different than just openly spreading those seeds. Uh, but with the seed bombs, they have that, that medium that's around them, the potting soil or the clay or whatever it is you're using. So uh, yeah, if you've got extra seed bombs or you wanna make seed bombs, absolutely. Winter, winter sowing is a nice way to be able to, to take advantage of both making the seed bombs and then putting them into your garden. Christy Grows, you mentioned the price of seeds being so high. If it's getting to be that way, it is really worth saving seed from your own plants. You can save seed from any plant vegetable you grow. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I think seed saving should be part of every gardener's repertoire. You should be saving seeds this year. Let's see. I, I, I only, it's all relative. I only saved about a dozen different seeds this year. That's because the last year, I think I saved about two dozen different seeds. And so I've, I've got so many packets and jars of seeds that I've saved in just the last two years that I don't need to buy any of those types of plants that I'm growing. And a lot of them are tomatoes and I've saved peppers and I've saved a lot of seeds because that's just the way I think you should do it. So completely agree with you. If you are buying seeds this year, and you're recognizing that it's costing a lot, start looking into what you can save. Now, you want to choose the open pollinated varieties that you can save the seeds from and then get the same variety as you plant it going into the years ahead. Uh, but that's easy to do. And especially like we talked earlier, where you're experimenting with different types of varieties, when you find that variety that works, Absolutely. I didn't say it earlier, but I'll say it now. Grow it to save the seeds. You can keep growing that plant that you know is going to do well in your garden. And it's like these Cosmos that I've been growing for a couple years now. They do great in my garden. I save those seeds. I sow those seeds. I haven't bought Cosmos seeds in a couple years now and probably won't again because I found something that works and I save the seeds and continue to go with it. Brett Lee's wondering if seed bombs are like clay balls. Yeah, and that's basically what it is. It's, it's a ball, typically clay and potting soil with seeds mixed into it. And they're called seed bombs because it goes back to the 70s with the idea of guerrilla gardening, where they would make these clay balls. And specifically in New York City is where it was most famous. And they would th throw this, these seed balls into vacant lots to grow into beautiful gardens. 
And so they would bomb that vacant lot with these seed balls, and they became known as seed bombs. Uh, so, yeah, you can call it a, a seed ball, a, a clay ball with seed, or a seed bomb, and it, it's all talking about the, the same thing. Jay's saying, every few years I clean out my seed library and the older seeds are broadcast, sown to give them a last chance at life. I like that idea. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny as far as what we find we end up doing. And I do the same thing without necessarily consciously doing it. If I've got a seed packet and it may be a couple years old, it may even be a new seed packet. But if there's only a couple seeds left in the bottom of it, I'll typically just go out and spread those seeds out into the open with the same idea. It's like no reason to save this seed packet with empty seeds in it, even though I do that way too much. Uh, but, but yeah, those extra seeds and those old seeds, by all means, good suggestion. Throw them out in the garden, and it's one of those things that you never know what's going to sprout up. But when it does, it's going to make your garden better. So go for it. Wally Bruns tried fried zucchini for the first time in a Chinese restaurant. Loved it. Now zucchini is a second, a close second to my bell peppers. Good for you. Yeah, I, I tried different types of zucchinis. from. Usually it's in the restaurant where you you taste something that you really like and decide that you want to grow it. And I agree with you. Zucchini is very high on my list that I grow every year. Uh, because I like it fried, and I like it grilled, and I like zucchini bread, all things that I may not have discovered in, in the distant past. But once I did, I realized, hey, I need to grow zucchini so I can do this again. So always nice to discover those kind of things and, and enjoy the, the garden as you start adding those plants sometimes that you don't have enough room for. But it's always fun. Tammy's found that shopping around for seeds works well. Little Shop of Seeds has basics, really inexpensive, and my gardener, great price. Yeah, they're in the U.S. <clears throat> and that's another thing about the seeds. When you find a good source, uh, go for it. Get those seeds, especially if you can get them cheap. I did some experimentation in recent years. Uh, I've talked about it in videos. I haven't made a, a video targeted on it yet. But the cheap seeds grow the same as the expensive seeds. The results are going to be the same. The, the, the seed, as long as it's from a reputable company that's giving out good seed, doesn't matter if you pay 99 cents for 20 seeds or if you pay $5 for 10 seeds, if it's the same variety of the same plant, you can put them side by side and you, in most cases, won't be able to tell the difference. And so I, I started making a video, but instead, like I said, I just talked about it in other videos. I bought seeds from the dollar store. And so it, at my dollar store, it was four seed packets for a dollar. Now, everything in the dollar store has gone up to a dollar twenty-five. So I'm guessing this year it's going to be four seed packets for a dollar twenty-five. But I, I did. I grew. I actually, actually, I think I did talk about this specifically in, in a video a couple years ago. So I bought seeds from the dollar store. I bought the same variety from MI Gardener, and then I bought the same variety from a company like Territorial Seed or Baker Creek Seeds. Three completely different price ranges. And then I grew those plants. I started those seeds because I did a lot of it with um, peppers and tomatoes in particular. And so I grew those seeds indoors to get the plants started. And then I put the plants side by side in my garden. No difference. No difference at all. And so um, I did that with black creme. I think I did, I think I did MI Gardener and Territorial Seed side by side with my black creme. And I saved, have saved black creme seed from those black creme tomatoes. I honestly don't know whether the original plant came from MI Gardener or Territorial Seed. Doesn't matter because a black creme tomato plant is a black creme tomato plant and it really doesn't matter what the source is. So if you're looking to save some money, you can go with the inexpensive seed. I like to support specific companies that I like their mission, particularly like Seed Savers Exchange. 
And so I try to buy every year. I'm a member of Seed Savers Exchange. I try to buy from Seed Savers Exchange just as a way to support that company. And there's a lot of other smaller family-owned seed companies that I buy seed from just to help support the company so that they stay in business. And then there's a lot of other seeds that when I do buy it, absolutely, I go with the cheapest seed because I know it's going to give me the same plant. So uh, buy cheap seed, open pollinated varieties you know are going to do well, save those seeds, and then you essentially will garden for free for the, the rest of your gardening career. And that's kind of the approach that I like to take. Like to take. So um, if you're not already doing it, start doing it. The fun, one of the fun things about saving your seeds is that you start learning about the life cycle of plants. I think you got to learn the life cycle of the insects in your garden and you got to learn the life cycle of the plants in your garden. So a, a plant like carrots. So I have a video that I did four years ago, I think, on how to save carrot seeds. And carrots are a biennial plant. You sow the seed this year, you let it overwinter, and then in the following season, the second season, a carrot will grow flowers and those flowers will seed. That holds true with a lot of the root vegetables we're growing. Beets are biennial. Uh, there's, there's plants that we think we could sow this year and save the seeds from, and until you actually do some research and try to save those seeds, you don't find out that it actually takes two years to be able to save those seeds. But as many of us have discovered recently, carrots as a biennial shouldn't seed until the second season. But if they get highly stressed early in their life, they can actually seed in the first season. And so for many of us who have been having crazy hot spells and crazy weather during our normal growing season, I get comments from people all the time saying, for the first time ever, my carrots flowered and seeded in the first year. And I actually had that happen last year as well. So learning about biennials as saving seed and then seeing that it doesn't work the way it's supposed to work because of the way the weather impacts, but that's wonderful gardening information. And you don't learn it unless you try to save the seeds from your plants. So absolutely go for it. And it's one of those things that you'll thank yourself for learning about. Sir Christopher O'Dell, thank you, Scott, for that knowledge of all seeds will work as the same seeds. Oh, you're very welcome. And it's, it's I like to save money as much as the next person. And so I'll definitely share that information. I think we should all be gardening as much as we can. One of the ways I look at it is if I've got $10 to spend on seeds, I'd rather be able to buy 20 seed packets than two seed packets. And so knowing that you can save money by buying a cheaper seed means you can just grow more with the money you have. And that can be a lot of fun. Dusty Flats, problem with saving seed is keeping things separated. Absolutely. And so I'd, I'd, I've got some videos on that as well that show you how I uh, categorize and and save my seeds. I think it's a two-year-old video uh, where I talk about how I save and store my seeds to try to keep them separated and organized because I agree with you. That is one of those things that can be difficult if you don't have a plan in place. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Masabi Gal says, 27 days out of my knee replacement and I'm so excited to garden without pain. Good for you. I should have done this two years ago. It's much more pain-free already. So that's nice. My I haven't had to deal with that. My brother has had both knees replaced. And so talking with him, that's one of those things that uh, if you if you need knee replacement, like you point out, you should have done it years ago. Most of the people I know that have had knee and hip replacements all say they wish they would have done it sooner. So I'm glad you'll be getting out in your garden pain-free. That's definitely a nice, nicer way to garden. I don't like gardening in pain. And so what, what you, all, you all don't see, occasionally you'll see it if I've shot some B-roll and I'm working on a project, but I, I'm always in the garden with my back brace on and with my gloves. And 
if I try to go out and do a quick project and I haven't prepared myself physically, it, it's usually painful. So whatever you can do to make gardening pain-free or at least lessen the pain, that's definitely the approach that you should be taking. So that's definitely the approach I like to be taking. And, and so uh, I wanted to, to end today. Um, and so uh, I, I noticed in the beginning today, Frank had said that Gardner Scott is good cabin fever therapy. And uh, I, I appreciate that sentiment. Uh, Patrick had made a comment on the, the members Facebook page. Uh, Patrick's one of our viewers from Australia. I haven't seen him checking in today, but it's hot there already. It's summer. And so in recent weeks, I've been talking about how in winter for us that are in, enjoying the cold, it's a great time to review videos and read the books and learn more. And so I thought it interesting that Patrick was saying, because it's so hot there in Australia right now, that's what he's doing. He's watching the videos and reading the books and learning more about gardening. And so it's one of those things that I think too often we categorize our gardening activities based on the time of year. And that's not a bad thing because as this new year approaches, there are things I do because the calendar year has changed. Usually it deals with the planning and setting forth the projects that I'm going to do. But you don't need to restrict yourself to only doing that at one time of year. I spend at least an hour every day watching videos. Most of them are related to either gardening or food preservation because those are the two things that I tend to spend most of my time on and I'm making more videos in both of those arenas. But every day I spend time trying to learn more about something that I either don't know or I don't know enough about, like the hydroponics. This last week, I spent a lot of time learning about ebb and flow hydroponics. That's the kind of system I got. You'll be seeing a lot more about how I'm using my ebb and flow hydroponics system. Don't limit yourself to just doing it when it's cold outside. Like Patrick, do it when it's hot outside. Do it like I do it every day, whether it's hot or cold. I try to carve out a small amount of time just to keep advancing my knowledge to a, an area where it can be easy. The more you know, the easier it becomes and throughout this gardening journey that we're on. So use this time when it's cold out, when it's rainy, when you don't have the opportunity to get out and do the things. And so like I talked about in the beginning with Mr. Tidy Garden, he's driving through Ireland in the rain and not being able to do the gardening. I talk about the snow and the cold. It could be the rain, it could be the heat. Just take some time out of your day to become smarter about gardening. And in the long run, it's going to be much better. Mala's howling in the background. Obviously, there's somebody outside. So I apologize for that if it's distracting, but she's helping to protect the garden and the home. Get out there and garden. I want to say thank you to Yankee Sista Homestead. It has been a wonderful 2020 two as we're looking forward to 2023 and i hope the gardening is really going to bring or your gardening is going to bring you everything you want andrea thank you for that super chat as well happy new year to you great chat to everybody be aware i think i mentioned this a couple weeks ago but i couldn't remember whether i did or not i'm not going to be here next week so there's not going to be a show on january 2nd but I'll be back on January 9th with uh, some exciting news. I'm actually um, doing a contest and giving away some free seeds, which is a great way to start. If you want to save seeds, go ahead and get some free seeds and then save them. And then you have gardens for the future without having to, to, to spend anything on the seeds. So more information about that on January 9th, but I won't be here on January 2nd. I hope everybody has a wonderful new year, and I hope the entire year of 2023 is wonderful for everybody. And for those of you that are uh, Gardner Scott channel members at the training and collaborator level, 
stick around because I'll be back in just a few minutes for a members only live stream. See everybody here in two weeks. Have a great new year, a safe new year, a healthy new year, and start thinking about gardening, doing that planning, that prep, and that learning. Lisa Potter just popped up. Thank you for that super chat, Lisa. Love your channel. Thanks so much. And thank you to all of you. It's been a great year. I'm looking forward to next year. I'm Governor Scott. Enjoy gardening. <laughs>